Welcome to PGCPS Teacher Talk. Uh, this was initiated into the county by myself and Rosette Barner Wiley, um, the Life Changer of the Year 2018 to 2019. And I am also the current Global Teacher Prize winner. And this PGCPS Teacher Talk is facilitated under the leadership of Mallory Menash in partnership with Prince George's County Public Schools. And it is also sponsored by the National Life Group's Life Changer of the Year program. Teacher Talk over the year has covered a variety of topics that are relevant to K-12 employees, including remote learning, social emotional learning, and other social justice topics. During these sessions, uh, of course, uh, staff and employees and educators share different perspectives and they collaborate uh, and share different um, best practices so that we can all gain experience and network with one another. And so today's topic is going to be on summer slide, how to avoid summer slide. And we know that's one of those topics that many people need strategies for over COVID, a lot of students ended up uh, going through that process of learning loss. And going back into the school, a lot of teachers were challenged in terms of trying to figure out how do we do learning recovery? So how do we not get back into that slump going into next year? So this is one of the reasons why we're finishing up this year with this topic, avoiding the summer slide so that we can all feel more comfortable going back into next year and knowing that our students will be coming back into the classroom a little bit better than how they came in this year. Um, and a, with a lot more content under their belt because a lot, a lot less will be lost. I'm going to go ahead and have my panelists introduce themselves. I'm going to go ahead and start with Ms. Monique Hurd. Good evening, everyone. My name is Monique Scott Hurd. I'm the instructional lead teacher at Surrattsville High School, 29 year educator and um, starting my doctorate next year and hopefully um, spend four or five more years here and, <laughs> and then try higher education. But I'm very interested in summer slide because I'm interested in the research around full year schools. All right, thank you. And Mr. Jacob Scott. My name is uh, Jake Scott. I'm high school math teacher at International High School at Langley Park. I am also the math department chair. Thank you, and Bethany Bromley Lynn. Hello, my name is um, Bethany Bromley Lynn. I am a third grade reading and writing teacher um, at Kettering Elementary, and I also serve as the third grade team lead and the PDLT. And I'm definitely interested in um, learning more about the summer slide and sharing what I know from a teacher's perspective on how students can avoid that summer slide. Thank you. And last but not least, Ms. Dory Bibcook. Hi, good evening, everyone. Again, uh, I am Dory Bibcook, a elementary special education chair at Rich Crest Elementary School. This is the end of my 23rd year in special education. And uh, summer slides are particularly special to me because I am a special educator. And so this is something, this is a uh, area that I typically have to deal with uh, every fall and uh, try to prepare at the end of every uh, spring semester how to prepare for it. Thank you so much for that. So we're going to go ahead and kick off today's session. What is summer slide? What is summer slide? And um, do we actually think that summer slide exists? So Dory, uh, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Oh, sure, sure. So. As a special educator, what we consider the summer slide is when a student has experienced academic gains in the spring of the previous year, and when they return in the fall, they are not exhibiting those same academic or behavioral uh, gains that they once did. And teachers are looking to uh, find instructional supports and strategies to recoup those skills that they may have lost during the uh, summer break. So, as teachers, we do consider the summer slide a, uh, a real thing. It is infamous, uh, such as Ms. Thorpe uh, noted earlier, that a lot of teachers had to deal with uh, students who had uh, skill deficits that were much different from what they may have exhibited in the spring of the previous year. So it does exist, 
we do as educators, parents, and students alike have to deal with it. Um, and it's, it's a part of education, especially for our students who may have, you know, learning deficits coming in the door. So yes, it, it's a real thing. Awesome. Uh, any anyone else want to add? I, I know um, sometimes there's this myth around, oh, you know, maybe it just doesn't exist. But um, have have we experienced as educators the fact that, you know, this is something that is real? Monique, I see you're not see you not in your head. Um, I definitely believe that it is real, but it's kind of an intuitive thing unless you're say you know, a fourth grade teacher and you had that class for third grade and you are, you know, an, um, intimately aware of where they were, you know, you have to rely on testing. And then, of course, it's pre and post test. And then what do you put on the pretest for this year to see if they um, lost knowledge from last year? And then you have to do a lot of data analysis. But what I um, was thinking with uh, Ms. Dory Bibb Cook was the behavioral summer slide definitely is mm -hmm. something that most teachers don't consider and that ah. you can see right away. Yes, I mean, I'm so glad you brought that up. You know what, that's something I never even considered either because I, I see Mr. Scott, um, you know, with a big smile on his face, but, um, you know, especially in COVID, you, we see a lot of students come back to school with different traumas um, and different um, behaviors that, that came from, you know, them not being able to socialize. Some of those middle school students who are, who are coming out of COVID from them not being able to socialize, they've lost like two summers of not going outside, you know, playing in the sun, playing on the playground, doing sports, doing extracurricular activities with their peers. Um, and those brought, brought in behavior issues or levels of um, lack of maturity, right? Um, which also um, contributes to those behavior problems. Mr. Scott? I want to uh, play devil's advocate uh, really quickly and say that I, th I think that as a math teacher, for example, uh, in unit one, students may learn about solving systems of equations. Uh, so they spend a week, two weeks learning about systems of equations, how to solve them. And I give them an assessment and they get an A, a B or C or whatever their respective grade is. I'm confident that you know, I've seen that if I give that same assessment at the end of the school year, most students have forgotten that material. And they say, oh, this is from unit one. And I think that one of the problems is how we hold students accountable for what they are learning. And um, what we are training them to do is you learn it for this unit, you take the assessment, and now you can clear out your binder for that unit. And um, I think that that's anything that you're not recycling that information and holding them accountable for it on a consistent basis, then that's gonna be problematic. Uh, fast forward to over the summer, our society, for example, if our parents aren't as holding the students accountable for their reading and writing, for example, I sat down with my 12 year old and was, I said, let me check your homework. So I looked at a writing assignment that she had done and it was horrendous. And uh, I think that whenever there's a lack of accountability, then you're going to lose information anyway. So I don't think we should just blame it on the summer. Um, mm -hmm. I just think it's systemic and it's something that we should look into. Ah, good point. Hmm. Uh, and see, that's, that's why we're coming together and discussing these things, because we have to demystify a lot of those perceptions, right? So I'm, I'm glad that, you're, you, that you actually brought that point up. So do you think that the summer slide contributes to, uh, which goes back to the point that um, Mr. Scott just made, uh, do you think that the summer slide contributes to the learning loss and learning gaps that students experience coming back into school. And that's one perspective that Mr. Scott shared. Um, Dory, do you wanna go ahead and share another one? Sure, sure. Just to piggyback on what Mr. Scott stated earlier about the level of accountability, I would agree. Uh, learning gaps or the summer slide, you can really attribute that to, if you don't use it, you'll lose it, right? And that's really what it is for our students. So if, if you want to look at how our students accountable for their learning during the summer, then that just means that they need to practice, right? But, but the, 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 uh, 
issue with getting us to have students practice reading, practice math, is that it's the summer and they want to break just like we want to break. Uh, so we have to really, really look at, uh, you know, that, that level of accountability, that level of consistency with practicing skills as how we can have the things that do contribute to learning gaps and learning loss not, you know, be as prevalent. So not to say that practicing during the summer is going to have that student increase a whole grade level or half a year in a certain skill set, but it will at least maintain a skill. Uh, if parents and community members or uh, family members that are engaged with the student can engage that student and uh, can, can really engage that student on an academic or behavioral uh, expectation and get them to do it consistently during the summertime. Again, it may not give them a, a huge gap in academic gains, but it will maintain where they were at the end of the spring. It, it is done with accountability and consistency. Right, I agree. Let me bring um, Bethany into this conversation. Um, so Bethany, how do you, how do you, um, how do students end up in a slump during the summer? I think students end up in a slump in the summer by not doing their normal routine. You know, when we have school, we have a routine. We're reading, we're writing, we're doing math, we're practicing our algorithms. And so going into summer, they almost lose like their schedule, their routine. Um, and I know I'm going into other questions, but my thought process is going into this is, you know, allow them to have that break. Like we all need to have that reset button, allow them to reset themselves, to refresh, give them that little break, but also bring them back in and say, okay, let's set a schedule for you where you can actually almost quote unquote, have a summer school, but don't make it so rigorous where they're doing school all day, every day throughout the summer, because you're just going to burn them out for the next school year. So create that schedule where they can get onto online platforms. They're still, they still have access to it. I'm not sure many parents are aware that they still have access to iReady and Dreambox throughout the summer. And so that will allow them to prevent that summer slide that we are, well, hopefully prevent that summer slide that we are here talking about. And uh, one of the things you just said is um, parents aware. You don't know if parents are aware, right? So we're gonna get, we're gonna touch that um, later, but whose responsibility is it to make sure parents are aware, right? We're gonna, we're gonna touch on that <laughs> in a little bit, um, but how does, it, how does it impact schools, teachers, and especially students? How does this level of, you know, <laughs> these, this um, learning loss and learning gap impact teachers and schools and students especially? I, I, I think that one of the things that uh, we have to be careful of, one, one of the things that makes a huge difference for students in over the summer is being able to travel, being able to see new things, um, being able to exercise different mental muscles. I remember traveling uh, to Japan and seeing toilets where, where the water was recycled before, after you wash your hands, the water is recycled into the tank to be flushed. So that experience opened my mind, my daughter's mind. They still talk about it until this day. So they were learning, they were being exposed to new things. Just like when you're working out, if you do the same routine every day, your muscles will become used to that and be bored. So sometimes the worst thing you can do is exposed to the this, students to the same thing that they're being exposed to during the school year. They're gonna get burnt out. And so you wanna take them to the grocery store and give them a $20 bill and say, okay, you can buy what you want. Now let's add that up. How much is that gonna be? How much is your change gonna be? Little things like that where they're, they're being active in a way that they are practicing what they've been exposed to. Maybe your child got in trouble with something and say, all right, I'm not gonna spank you, but what I, what you, if you don't want to get a spanking, what you got to do is write to me why you shouldn't receive a spanking for what you did. Um, so just something where you're giving a, the child something different, a chance to implement what they're learning, and I think that's something that we should be able to do. Giving a kid a camera over the over the summer, you know, take some pictures. Let's get them developed. Let's write about what you've what you've taken a picture of. 
Yeah, not just not just uh, sit and twiddle your thumbs on that phone. Use the phone camera. <laughs> <laughs> Use the camera on the phone for a, for an actual educational purpose. So I'm going to go ahead and intro introduce um, Dr. Lovely Fantilan. And if you could please, uh, thank you for joining us. If you could please introduce yourself really quickly. Thank you so much. I, I was having trouble with the internet, so I like and leave. Come on, let's talk. My name is Dr. Fantilanen. I'm um, a science teacher at the International High School. I teach forensic science and physics for both our juniors and seniors. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so you can jump into the conversation wherever you see fit. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you, you, if you have something to say, go ahead. Um, I just would like to add a point from what Mr. Scott has been saying. The bigger problem is how students spend their time outside of the classroom. So middle-class students usually are more likely to like read every day because they have books everywhere. They, they attend camps, they visit art galleries, they go places, museums, historical sites with their families. So one of the things that I really think through when it's summer is there's a lot of things at home that we can use that are evidence-based if that we go back to, if the parents are aware that there, there are these simple things that they can use at home, water, um, you can get a droplet and count from the elementary to high school, you can vary those things. You can like count the number of droplets in a penny, uh, how many droplets that water ma can make in a penny to like you can do it in a question form for a high school student. They can even make um, a table or a data for those ones. Then they can put that in an evidence form curriculum. But then the question is, are our parents aware of that? I like that question when uh, somebody said that. Yes, definitely. And we're, and we're going to, we're definitely going to address it because we want to make sure that parents who are not aware are aware. So I, I know that, I know that um, in these sessions, we try to stick to evidence-based and research and, um, and, uh, and anecdotal experience in the classroom to be as true to what we're sharing as possible. But I think I watched, I, 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 um, I was reading somewhere about how this whole thing about summer started, right? And when you thought, when you said uh, middle-class families, it came back into my head and I was like, hmm. So, you know, when we think about how summer actually started, right? It was more so when, uh, because in, during the summer months, it is so hot. And then back in the day, they didn't have air condition and fan and proper ventilation. And so the middle-class and upper-class families would find themselves going to the Hamptons and places for um, vacation stays to be in area, you know, to the beach and those places. And so then that leaves out our vulnerable population of kids who don't have anywhere to go. And so when, um, which is also the whole argument around equity, right? And so when these students are out of school where food is being provided, where extracurricular and all those things are being provided or resources are being provided, what happens to them in the summer when schools shut down and these middle and upper class, because these middle and upper class families advocate for there to be no school in the summer, you know, and the vulnerable population of students um, end up suffering as a result. So I don't know how exactly true it is, but that's what I read. <laughs> um, but I'm sure there's some, there's some truth to it. Uh, if anyone would like to jump in and verify. Well, yes, I would like to say that uh, it is true that most times uh, students from lower socioeconomic uh, families do have more experience with summer slides uh, and a lot of it has to do with parents being aware and it also has to do with parents having the access to resources so even if they are aware they may not 
be able to have, they may not have that access, such as the middle and upper class families who are able to go and vacation during the summertime, maybe have a tutor if they need to, or get their children a tutor once the fall starts. And lower socioeconomic uh, families don't have access to those resources, uh, let alone maybe access to uh, a library at home or um, uh, anything that can be used for math manipulatives in order for them to practice math skills. Uh, so a lot of times it is because of parents, one, not being aware of the resources, and two, just not having access to it. So not being able to access those resources for their students. And we have to remember a lot of times our low, lower socioeconomic students, those parents are working outside of the home many, many more hours than our middle class uh, parents are. And so a lot of times they may not even have the time to sit down, schedule how they are going to access these uh, resources for their students. And yeah, and, and, and you're so right. They, there are so many dis, um, lack of resources, especially for students who go to, who are in the public school system. There are just not enough resources, especially over the summer. Even when students actually go to school in the summer, um, because of also learning deficits during the school year, it's just not enough to recover that. And research actually shows that as well. That um, and and there are quite a bit of summer programs also that are run by people who are not in the academic space, and so that to some degree does not help them to recover either. So uh, based on what I just um, preface. How, how is Summer Slide related to a lot of these educational inequalities and inequities? Quickly, I wanted to kind of go back to the summer break, spring break, um, the advent of it. It was also agriculturally based, where spring break was when, you know, farmers needed to put in the crops, plant the crops, and then, of course, they needed their kids at home to help harvest during, or not harvest, but tend the crop during the summer. Um, you know, and so a lot of that had to do with farmers, not necessarily just socioeconomic, talking about the heartland mostly in the South. Um, in terms of inequities, um, I know I've read that just reading a book, just one book during the summer makes a huge difference, especially for lower economic students, um, makes more of a difference than it does for middle and higher socioeconomic students, I guess because they have more some of them have, like you said, less access, but now within the digital age, everyone has access to some kind of reading on their phone. So I don't wanna say there's no excuse, but the access is there because I don't care how much money your you know family tends to have. It seems like everyone has at least a phone and they can go in and they can just read something. So that, that I know we're getting into tips and, and solutions toward the end, but just reading, just even with the math, you know, how many pages did you read? Average that out over the week each day. Like you can even throw math into reading. And of course that would benefit them in science. That'll benefit them in social studies. So reading comprehension seems to be the one place where um, if you can make gains over the summer or at least maintain over the summer your reading comprehension, you know, it really will help in the, in the new year. Dory, I see you nodding your head. Did you want to add something? No, just that I agree. Uh, I, I fully agree uh, with Ms. Scott Heard as far as, you know, there are uh, a plethora of, of resources now for our students to access. Uh, whether it is appropriate or not is a different story. But, <laughs> but uh, yes, you know, there are definitely uh, uh, technology has afforded us the ability to have more access uh, to information such as stories, math, uh, as uh, we stated earlier in this, uh, in this session, is that for PGCPS, many of our students still have access to the uh, te technological pro pro programs uh, that they're using during the school year, such as Lexia and iReady and uh, Dreambox. So uh, technology has afforded us um, a uh, means to reach our students that we hadn't had in the past. So I, I would agree with Ms. Cotter. Yes. Um, and and uh, you know, these sessions are recorded and uh, teachers from across the 
different um, landscape have access to this. So when we think about uh, students in the rural areas, though, um, how do we don't um, do we think that these inequalities or inequities actually helps to widen the achievement gaps and why? The, the one students, a lot of students who are not necessarily uh, reading in the summer are getting a lot of practical experience. Um, they may be going to work with their parents and their parents are mechanics. Um, I think the, the key is keeping students engaged and I think helping them to become producers versus consumers. Uh, that's, that's the huge thing. And economics are a huge factor in that. If, you, if both parents are out of the home and there's no accountability in the home, I mean, let's just face it. Some of our students are just at home consuming TikTok videos all day. Those students become consumers. Uh, some students go to work with their parents uh, and they may never read a book, but they can count money, <laughs> you know? And so um, I think that, uh, you know, and, and they're learning discipline and they're learning responsibility. A lot of those soft skills that, that we don't necessarily uh, account for. But I think the biggest thing is students being producers versus consumers. And I think that another thing, just a practical thing that we can do is as the middle class or educated people, education begets education. And I think that if we realize that these less fortunate uh, members of our society are still members of our community and our society, and we'd be doing ourselves a favor to pull one of those in and say, you know what, we're traveling to wherever this summer, let's talk to your parents, or hey, let's get you set up with this uh, IXL account or whatever, just to keep those students engaged as well, because we know what's going on in the home. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, and, I, and I put that in the chat, you know, consumers versus producers, how are we making sure that students are actually practically engaging over the summer, rather than just sitting on the couch, you know, Netflix and chill, um, <laughs> you know, watching reruns and, you know, and, and all those things and sitting on their phone and video games and so on. How are we making them producers? What are they building? What are they making? Um, so what do we do for students who are just adamant about the fact that now that school is out, they need a break. So, you know, uh, Jacob, you talk about consumers and not producers. And again, students will want to sit on the couch and they want to be consumers. They're like, oh, we've been working all, all school year. I don't want to do anything. I need a break. Uh, like, you know, this funny part about it is um, I have a student in my class who didn't do his work and uh, he was he came in for tutoring for, um, with me today and I said, we're at the same place that you left yesterday. Did you do anything yesterday when you go home? He's like, no. And I said, why? He's like, well, I went to sleep. I said, did you go to sleep the whole time after you went home? You slept the whole evening? He's like, yes, I'm taking care of my mental health. I said, hmm. That's funny because the last time I checked, mental health really means that you create a balance in your life. So I'm going to explain to you what mental health means. Since you are so adamant about taking care of your mental health, today you're stressed out and you feel like I'm stressing you out because you left everything and we only have one day left, right? Mental health is you go home, you do an hour of that homework, and then you sleep or take a nap and then you come back to it, do a little bit more and go to bed for the rest of the night. And then tomorrow you come, you only have a little left and then you do a little. Now you're stressing today because the assignment is due tomorrow and you slept all night last night. But of course, I know he was lying because he's a video freak. <laughs> so I know he was probably up playing video games all night. I'm like, he would stay up playing video games all night. So him, so maybe that's how him taking care of his mental health. <laughs> but I had to explain to him that you have to create a balance. And a balance is you have to, you have to know how to balance work and play. And so those students in the um, over the summer. Well, when we're thinking about them saying, oh, I want to take care of my mental health. I want to break. Leave me alone. I don't want to read a book. I mean, what do we say to those parents um, and, those, and, and those students? 
firm believer in, you know, allowing those students to have their space and their time, like I said earlier, to decompress, to really truly allow them to have that break, but not to, you know, allow them to get too comfortable with that break. I do like what Jacob Scott did say, you know, about giving them real world experiences and that still can, you know, encompass, you know, their learning and apply those strategies that they've learned in school the previous year so they can be ready um, and on top of their game the following school year. All right, uh, Dr. Fentelani, you want to jump in? I just would like to add, I think there's two important, two words that are very important during summer school. One, expectation. Two, intentional. As mm -hmm. a school, as a teacher, as a district. We have to have high expectation for students. I think students don't do anything because we, we did not expect them to do anything. To. So if we put our expectation that high during summer, you need to learn something. You need to do this um, evidence-based curriculum so that when you come back, we're going to, we are expecting that we can talk about the things that you've learned that you've done during this two months that you are out of, out of school. So we have to set our bar, our bar a little high. And then we are intentional. What are the things that the kids need to learn during summer? They don't need to really have a curriculum based thing over the summer. Just the things that they do when they read, when they talk about numbers, when they count the money that they earn from, from the job that they had during the summer, those are very important and very critical things that the kids can express during in September. So there, that, that's, I think, the two things that we as a teacher, as a school, and as a district need to do. We have to have high expectation and we have to be intentional of the things that, what the kids need to do over summer. You know, I like the fact that you say intentional because um, we, we've talked about uh, upper, we, we were talking about the upper mid um, class versus the lower class, right? And when we think about the students who are in private schools, most private schools give students a, some of them even go to the point of, not that I'm saying it's right, but um, go to the point of giving students curriculums um, or giving them a whole book list uh, of books that they have to read over the summer. It, it's, it's not a, oh, read this because, you know, it's fun. It's read this because these are some things that you're going to be touching on and we need you to keep your critical thinking level up to a certain, um, you know, at a certain point where when you come back into the school and we're having these discussion, you're right on par and we're not starting all over. And those are the, like you said, those are the expectations and they live up to those expectations. And they're, those parents hold their kids to those expectations. And sometimes I think we see our public school students in a deaf, from a deficit mindset where we think that, oh, because they're working, they won't be able to read. Oh, because they're the, because, but again, because we're not intentional, we don't have to give them 10 books like a private school, but be intentional about what is it that we want them to bring over into the new school year? What is it we want them to hold on to? What skills do we want them to continue to retain and to really work on? and be intentional about that and set those expectations. Our students will live up to the expectations if they know that we hold them to it, they will. So we should definitely stop seeing our students from a deficit mindset, stop making excuses for them because those students in the private schools are the same students that they are going to compete with when they graduate. So we need to make sure that we're setting those same level of expectations for them so that they can compete for scholarships for college and they can compete for places in the work in the workspace as well. All right, so as we move as we move on, how about students who have to work and take care of their siblings? How do we keep their saw sharp, sharpened over the summer? I was just going to go back to reading. You can read to your siblings while you're at home with them. <laughs> right. You can, you know, pick up a book and read during your break or, you know, initiate some kind of, I think we need to be role models. Um, I know for my personal children, they read more when they saw me reading like, mom, okay, you're reading. I'd be like, yes, um, yes, I'm reading. Well, I'm going to go watch. No, you're not. Well, what am I supposed to do? You got three books that you started. Why don't you work on one of them? So when they saw me reading, they read more. 
Um, I think also parent communication or keeping that connection. I know with my students and my parents, I use Remind during the year. And every once in a while in the summer, I'll shoot out a message. And, you know, um, every once in a while, I'll get a message back. Oh, can you take me off this list? But most of the time is, hey, it's got to hurt. You know, what are you up to? Oh, nothing. I'm just um, reading this book, Fahrenheit 451. And uh, I was wondering if, you know, you had thought about maybe getting that book for your child. Oh, sure. Well, let's read it all together. So even if, you, you know, it's just a matter of keeping communication and, and showing, like you, um, like Dr. Fantelaine, I think, said, having the expectation. If you have a high expectation, they will try to at least reach it and, and, and not think of them from that deficit mindset. I think that's a, a good phrase to use. They can do it. Prince George's County used to have a book list maybe 20 years ago for the summer. <laughs> We did, and I don't know what happened to it. It kind of became optional, and then it just kind of went away. And I think the more and more, I call it making them soft, but the less and less struggle that these children have, the less and less they feel like they can achieve and that they can overcome these obstacles and that their social emotional health is, you know, is, is suffering because, oh, woe is me. I really just think reading a book, and I'm a science person and I just advocate reading, reading as much as you can, reading the newspaper, reading the circular that comes in the mail, reading, reading, reading is, is I think the key, especially during the summer. Uh, even current events, you know, give them a, shoot them a current event on a Google document and, and see the ones that do it. And you don't have to require all of them. My A's and B students, I leave them alone in the summer. It's my D and E students that I really harass <laughs> over the summer and every once in a while I get a little something from them so it's better than nothing I think. All right thank you uh Mr. Scott you want to just go uh, ahead. That was that was great Ms. Scott and I, I would I would add I think that one of the things that we have kind of lost sight as as educators is our role in the community for example if there was a mechanic in your community everyone's going to say hey you know I got an issue with my car can I talk to you for a second well, we, we are the, the educators of the community. And um, I think that, uh, you know, if I had a dollar for every time uh, I saw a situation where the parents didn't check students' grades or didn't reward students for their grades and students felt unappreciated and discouraged, I'd be a millionaire. Um, and I think that uh, we, as the educators in the community, uh, should see ourselves in that light. I, I had a story that touched my heart um, I remember I, I bought a house in Silver Spring right down the street from the school that I was going to be teaching at. And um, later, a couple of days later, a week later, I saw these, these kids in the neighborhood sitting on top of the blue public mailbox and everything. And I said, oh, my goodness, where have I what have I moved into? And these kids walked home and they live right across the street from me. And I said, oh, my goodness, here we go. And uh, so I said, you know what? I can either I can either run or I can, you know, join forces with these kids. And so I say, you know what, guys, let, let's talk. And so I remember pulling that group of kids together and say, hey, look, we're going to start a, a program. I'm going to get you guys some T-shirts I'm going to buy you some donuts. And we're going to go out on uh, Sunday mornings. I'm sorry, Saturday mornings and, and clean up. So we got some tongs from Home Depot and a cart and everything and uh, the recycling bins. And fast forward 15 years later. One of these young men bumped, he ended up working at uh, the same workplace and he, his boss was a gentleman that I went to school with. And they were talking, oh yeah, you know, Miss just Jake Scott, blah, blah, blah. He said, yeah, he was my mentor. And I mean, that just melted my heart. I never saw myself as this kid's mentor, <laughs> you know, but just seeing this kid and I remember his, the dad, his mom was in a relationship with a boyfriend, the boyfriend was an alcoholic. And, you know, just little things like that. And you know what that typically produces, but you're seeing and thinking that perhaps my small influence in this young man's life changed the trajectory when I saw myself in my appropriate role in my community. Yeah, and that is so important. I think a lot of us sometimes as teachers do not necessarily go beyond the classroom to do the things that we need to do to ensure that students uh, are, show up, are able to show up for us the way we want them to. Um, and so I, that is definitely admirable. I know Mr. Scott, I don't think um, last year I, um, I ran an internship 
um, a social justice and civic engagement internship during the summer for some of my students, the seniors and also juniors. Um, and it was very successful last year and I'm going to do it again. And that was one of the ways that I, I tried to get some of my students civically engaged because those specific students, I knew that they were not going to, they're not working and they were at home and it's in the pandemic and most of them, their parents didn't even want them to leave. And so I had to figure out how do I keep them engaged with some of the time that I have. And it, I mean, it worked out so well. They did action research projects. They were able to present to the Senator. Um, they were able to present to a uh, number of county leaders. And as a result of that, Jimmy ended up um, being a page at the Senate office this, um, this um, at the Senate floor this year as well. So some of those opportunities that teachers can help uh, students with over the summer can lead to other future opportunities. And like you said earlier, you know, you end up being such a great influence that you didn't even realize. So right. we should definitely, uh, I think, who said it earlier? Um, Monique said it earlier, modeling, modeling, modeling and communication, right? So if we're modeling um, and we're um, creating those opportunities for students, that's what one of the one of the things that will help them to um, get over going through the summer slide. So Dory, let's bring you back into this conversation. So how do we, as I said, that's one way of beating the summer slide. So what are some other ways that we can beat the summer slide? Oh, wow. Well, many of us have already stated a number of those things uh, that we can do uh, as educators or as parents. Um, taken out into the community, having real world experiences, such as taking to a, going to, to Target or to Walmart and having students uh, pay for transactions, going to the library, oftentimes during the summer and especially during, or during the fall, I think it's an extension of the summer, uh, you will find libraries will have uh, book clubs for students. Uh, libraries may have, say, middle school book club on one night, elementary school book club on another night. Uh, so it's a lot of different things that uh, parents can do uh, during the summer as far as community resources, uh, such as libraries, museums, and, and other real world activities. Uh, one of the things that uh, we used to do, special educators would do uh, some years ago before uh, all of our uh, technical advances is we would make summer packets and that would just be copies of, of uh, you know, skill sheets that they worked on throughout the year. But they, when students look at them, they will recognize it as, oh, I've done this before. And so it's not, it's not a real challenge, but at least it will get them to exercise that skill that, that teachers have identified as this is something I really want you to work on over the summer. So old school way, yes, we would create those, those summer packets, you know, at, at least this thick, right? We would kind of give <laughs> them up so they wouldn't feel so overwhelmed. But we would, we would definitely encourage those parents to please, 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 you know, just a couple of days out of the week, ask them to go get one of those little packets and work on the weekend. Uh, I think it's important for us to uh, remember that we still need those parents to uh, be accountable to, to their students as far as, uh, I, I need you to work on this. You know, this is important. We want you to carry at least a good portion of your skills into the next school year. So I'm going to partner with your teacher to make sure that you're getting, you know, your summer packet completed. So if we definitely covered, you know, a, a, the gamut as far as, uh, activities that students can do over the summer. But I think the main thing as educators and as a parent, what we really want to emphasize is that it's engaging for the students because what we don't want is for parents to run into behavior and non-compliance and then they just throw their hands up and say, well, they'll get it when school starts. <laughs> and we, you know, we don't want that. We want parents to really feel as though uh, it's second nature for them to support their students through the summer. We don't want them to, to feel like, hey, this is a challenge. So at home, we really would like for uh, the activities that they do to come naturally and organic so that neither the student or the parent feels uh, 
you know, that it is a challenge for them to do so. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the most important things that you what, that I hear you said was partnering with parents, right? So that, that is so important um, that we engage parents as well and let them know that they're also accountable for this as well. And uh, I remember when I was in um, maybe in middle school, you know, what they used to do is we used to clean out the book room before we go off for summer and they everybody has to take a consumable that was not used. <laughs> We all, they made us all take all the consumables. And I remember those packets that was, that were printed out that we had to take home as well and then bring it back to school. And that was our first, our first grade for the year. And we would feel such pride in doing it because that we're like, oh, I start out with an A. If I finish this packet, I get an A. I start my year with an A. You know, so that again, setting that level of expectation and giving kids, um, kids, something that makes them feel excited, not making it so challenging, but something that will engage them and make, bring that excitement and setting that level of expectation. Like it is going to be graded. So make sure that you complete it. It will be your first grade, you yeah. know, but, you know, but also not use it as punitively if it's not completed, you know? Um, so what are some, so let's, let's break it down. What are some, what are some things that Parents, I hear we, we talked about parents. So let's go back to parents. What are some things that parents themselves can do to help students get through the summer um, and keep them engaged? I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, I, I am gonna go back to the modeling. If the kids see their parents doing it, then more than likely, hopefully the kids will wanna jump on board too. So just modeling and having them be a part of some of their summer activities that they may be um, engaged in. And I just keep on going back to what Mr. Scott said is those real life experiences, you know, taking that child to work, you know, letting them have those um, hands-on experiences and just extending it further where, you know, not every child is gonna go to college, there's technical schools. And even as a third grade teacher, I've had those conversations with my students. Okay. You don't have to go to college. You can go to a technical school and be a mechanic and own your own business because I take my car to a mechanic and so many other people do as well. So those hands-on experiences um, as well with parents. And I'll jump back in about the reading. Even mechanics have to read specifications. Even plumbers have to, you know, read the most recent machine tools that they need to use. So there is literacy, I guess. I guess that's the general term I should use. There is literacy in every experience that they can have. And in the neighborhood, uh, like Mr. Scott and um, Ms. Bethany said, there's plenty of people who are say, oh, you know, okay, come on in. Like I may not pay you at $3 an hour, but you know, come on in and, and I'll give you some exposure. And you know, just to kind of get them out of the house and off the couch, even if it's two hours a week, just any little thing that the community can do and that we can encourage the community to do like you said, as modeling. I know my, my home was open a lot during the summer when I first started teaching and parents appreciated that. And then when the parent would come pick the kid up, I'd say, you know, hey, um, we're reading this brochure. Can you sit down there with them and do it? Of course, it's different, elementary versus high school. I know we're all either elementary or high school. I didn't hear anyone say middle. So there's, you know, a little differentiation that needs to happen there. But trying to just connect with parents, shoot that remind message or that, what are we on now, power school, school messenger, whatever we're on using now, shoot a message out at least once and say, um, Nova has a really cool special coming on and there's an ancillary question sheet or just something so that they know that we're thinking about them and we have the expectation, you know, that they do something other than just TikTok. I don't know how we can make TikTok educational. I've been trying to figure that out because <laughs> I think I'd get rid of a lot of my size. I'll give you an idea how to make TikTok educational. Yes, I mean, go ahead. First yeah. of all, I, I think that the algorithms that are involved in TikTok are, TikTok is very similar to opening a bag of Lay's chips. <laughs> you can't eat just one. Oh, <laughs> and and um, there's brilliance in that. Uh, on the part of the programmers, but unfortunately for the consumers, it spells trouble. And um, that's just very unfortunate. But I think going back to what parents could do, I think one of the things that uh, parents could do is uh, taking a child to start a statutory bank account. 
helping a child to form, like if the parent starts a home-based business and that parent employs their child, then that parent can pay their child and not pay, it's a tax write-off basically. And so I think that, I mean, little things like that, um, we, my company, for example, helps students to, to get, parents to get start those things where they can pay their children, but that way the child becomes, like I said, a producer versus a consumer. Uh, my daughter spends her summers um, helping to clean the Airbnb and making hats that she sells. Um, and it's all, you know, tax write-offs. And um, I think that, you know, those are some things, just a couple of things that parents can do to um, yeah. help with loss of education. Did I see you have your, um, I think I saw at some point your, your daughter put up her tax, her taxes. You are helping yeah. do her taxes because I think she made over $10,000. Yeah, um, she did. In Airbnb and, and doing her little sales. So yeah, there are definitely things that parents can help their students. And not only that, but you're teaching them to be entrepreneurs. You right. know, they're learning, not only are you enhancing the skills that they've learned in school, but you're also teaching them new skills. So that's just a cool way of also um, teaching students new skills that they will eventually end up using like anyway in, um, in the school system, um, in their classes. So as we're, as we're winding down, what are some ways that, you know, when we think about the obstacles that parents go through with choosing maybe summer programs for their, um, for their kids and then and, and going through financial challenges, what are some, uh, other than, things that they can do in, in home for those parents who have say younger, younger children who they can't leave at home. And of course, parents have to work. What are some fun places or what are some community resources you could probably share that you know of that you can probably share that parents can look into to keep their students, uh, the students engaged over the summer and out of trouble, as we would always say. <laughs> I think the recreation centers in the neighborhoods have pretty good programs. Um, I live in District Heights, and when I first started teaching, you know, they would hire teachers just to come in, and it was mostly play and recreation, but they would have a one or two hour session of learning each day, and, um, you know, we'd pull them in and just kind of do little diagnostic tests and see where they were, and then work with them individually on some skills that they were lacking, mostly um, math and, and reading, but the, the rec centers are really good, the recreation centers. Now, I don't know what COVID has done. I know COVID has given us a bird's eye view into some of the challenges that are going on in students' homes, but it's also allowed us to, you know, reset and, and look back and say, okay, families are spending more time together, so maybe we can take advantage of that. It's got to be something going on in the neighborhood where I know Watkins Park, there's some kind of Juneteenth festival. So maybe the county can put out some kind of, hey, you know, a scavenger hunt at the Juneteenth festival just to get people out and, and answering questions and reading about the history. Any little thing I think would be, would be useful. So the summer school program maybe could add that in the county. That's some programs or something really targeted in each one of the neighborhoods related to the rec centers. That's an idea. Yeah, rec center is definitely a good place where a student, um, where parents can find resources. Also, churches. Churches have um, Bible schools and other uh, and other creative activities, and uh, uh, that are you know they may have some teen activities, some um, young uh, elementary school uh, student activities, um, and some of them even have like little daycare, drop off daycare where they they do different programs for younger students where their parents can just drop them off and come back and pick them up later as well. Uh, anyone else want to add some resources that they can parents can tap into? Um, I know local libraries many times they'll offer um, certain programs or little mini camps. Um, I'm not sure if the elementary schools still do or not, but I know there's certain programs that will go into our elementary schools and have programs almost like a camp for a few weeks or something like that. Um, I'm not sure if that's still a program that exists because of COVID, but I do know libraries offer a plethora of um, opportunities for students. 
Yeah, um, and to that point, libraries also have like reading nights, um, movie nights, and also check your local community bulletin. A lot of communities from the mayor's office, they may produce um, bulletins. They may have like bike rides over the summer, little summer camps. They also have community service activities. That's one of the things that we did here. So we're thinking about more so a lot of the activities for younger kids, but for high schoolers, community service activities is a great time to delve into those as well. And I, I would say um, one thing for parents too is that they can always check on Eventbrite. Eventbrite has so many different events that are happening in your communities that you can look on Eventbrite, find out what's going on in your community, uh, check your community bulletin, CSTV or PGC TV, um, PGC uh, or yeah, PG County TV. Uh, they usually have those in the bulletin as well. So definitely check out those local channels because they always have something engaging that's going on in the community. Fairs, right? Fairs, water parks <laughs> are great opportunities as well for students to have fun and still engage in learning opportunities. And so before we actually go, I would, I would like to go around and just ask everyone to give us a final assessment of where you will be in terms of next year, coming out of the summer and going into the next school year in terms of how will you be assessing learning loss and what are some strategies that you will, you will use in order to recover some of those learning loss, be it that it is inevitable that it will happen. So just, uh, just give us some strategies that you will use moving forward going into 2021, um, 2022, 2023. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into the curriculum hub and I'm gonna see what they should have learned last year in their science class. Um, I think it's important for educators to have some kind of vertical integration knowledge. What do they do in the last few years and what do they need to know next year so you can, you know, um, be familiar with the fluidity and, and be better able to assess it. So I'll just do a little learning myself so I can be ready for them. And Mr. Scott? Uh, here uh, within our math department, we always begin the year with a uh, BOY diagnostic. Uh, and uh, the other, one of the things that we've implemented as well is uh, we made summer school not a punitive thing, but we always open up summer school to students who want to get ahead. And so I'll be uh, this summer spending time with uh, about 20 uh, students who will be taking summer school classes to get ahead. Yeah, um, well, thank you for mentioning that as well. Um, summer school original credits is also one way of helping students to uh, overcome that summer slide. Um, Bethany? I'm definitely gonna start with looking at their data, looking at their articulation cards um, from the previous school year and starting with those pre-assessments and having those one-on-one um, -on -one conversations um, with those kids with goal setting and letting them know where I want them to go. And not only it's about me, but them too, where they see themselves going and progressing um, throughout the school year. All right, and Dory, and um, from an administrative perspective as well. Uh, I think for me, I've already started uh, for my, you know, for the students that are in, uh, that come under the special education umbrella. And that's by preparing those summer packets, talking to parents about, uh, the access that students will continue to have during the summer. I have uh, set up some meetings with parents to just help them be able to know how to uh, make sure that their students are logging on in the, in, you know, logging on to the uh, platforms correctly. So special education, we try to start before the summer hits. Uh, so we try to prep our students and then in the fall we will do as uh, Bethany and Monique and, and Jacob have stated as far as during our diagnostics looking at Arctic uh, data from the year before and just uh, you know taking our time as far as truly assessing where that student is not making you know not being presumptuous as far as what their skill levels are and, and just really analyzing that data. All right well uh, thank you thank Thank you so much for sharing that. So we're going to, um, so this is the end of our session.
And thank you to our illustrious panel. I hope you have learned something today, if um, our attendees. I would like to thank all of our panels and moderators who have made these sessions over this year very successful each month from September to now June. Uh, I would also like to thank PGCPS Communications team for sharing this opportunity in the bulletin to reach out more of our teachers. And thank you to Matt and Mallory from the Life Changer of the Year program for this platform to facilitate teacher education and development. And thank you to my co-creator, Rosette Barner Wiley from Value Teachers. Also, thank you to if you are an administrator, a teacher, a staff member, or even a colleague who represent who uh, shared the session with your other colleagues and friends. Thank you for doing so. And if you have missed out on any of these sessions, please go to the lifechangeroftheyear.org to see all of our recordings. Um, also please complete the form that I'll put in the chat if you want to be a panelist or a moderator for our future sessions in school year 2022, 2023. So in November, please continue to visit the lifechangeroftheyear.org website to register for future sessions. And please check the PGCPS Express in the future as well um, for all of our updates on our new sessions that will be coming up. I am again, Kishtia Thorpe, and thank you for your participation and your support. And until next year, this is our final session. So have a wonderful, wonderful summer.